Lord, thank you, Lord, the presence of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. It is here to do God's work, His work, in a mighty, miraculous way. Oh, thank you, Father. We honor you tonight. We honor you with our worship. We honor with our praise. We honor with our hearts. That our hearts are open to receiving what you have in a mighty, mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's just continue to worship. We worship you, Lord. We magnify you. We glorify you. You're our God. You're my Father. You're my Father. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's say this together. I open my heart to receive more from you, Lord. More. There's always more in Jesus. There's always another step. There is always another uh, level of commitment and dedication to Jesus. He is my Lord. He is my God. He is my King. He is my Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And we thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice that never ceases to amaze us or humble us before your throne. And we give you praise and glory that you're soon coming. You're soon calling your people home is close at hand. And we thank you, Lord, that you keep us on track with you in proper alignment with what you are calling each of us individually and corporately as a body of Christ to carry out your last assignments before you call your people home. We thank you and praise you, Lord. You are our God, and we adore you and love you, and we give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, one way we love God is how. Let's tell our visitors, how do we love God here? By loving each other, by loving one another. That's how we love God. Amen? Amen? Shake somebody's hand, give them a hug, say, welcome to Church of the Word. Good evening, everyone. Wow, that was quick. We're all back in our seats. <laughs> Great to see everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our visitors. So glad you're here. Um, so yeah, I just had to think when we were singing this song, I'm no longer a slave to fear. You know, sometimes when fear comes knocking on the door, I just had to think in my own life, we can go into condemnation simply because we're dealing with it. But we don't have to go into condemnation we're no longer slaves to fear. It may come as a temptation, but we're now a child of God, and we're overcomers in that area. <laughs> Praise God. Just thought I'd share that. Um, so as for announcements, Monday, um, a prayer meeting here from noon to 1 o'clock. Everyone's welcome. Tuesday evening at 7.30, instead of our um, Usual uh, Bible study, Pastor Jay will be teaching a special service on how to serve, correct? So please come, everyone welcome. 
Um, it will be out here in the main auditorium. There will be no child care for younger children, so parents may want to think ahead for that. But it's going to be great. You won't want to miss it. So, Hallelujah. Good evening, everybody. Wow, we're a little empty tonight. <clears throat> but that's all right. Praise God. Well, you all can turn with me to 2 Corinthians 8, where we've taken up our tithes and offerings. And who's excited for this part of the service? Yeah. Whoop! <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> yeah, 2 Corinthians 8 is where we're going to go. I'm going to... Um, We'll start in verse 1. So, it starts off, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God granted to the churches of Macedonia. During a severe testing by affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed into the wealth of their generosity. So their abundance of joy, they were overjoyed at the opportunity to give, even though the way it sounds, they didn't have much at the time. I testify that on their own, according to their ability and beyond their ability, they begged us insistently for the privilege of sharing in the ministry of the saints. They begged. This version says begged. I'm not sure if I quite got to that yet. (laughs) I mean, running after a ministry to beg them to, to give or to even though there's plenty of opportunity. (laughs) Hallelujah. And not just as we had hoped. Instead, they gave themselves especially to the Lord, then to us by God's will. Trying to remember here. Yeah, so we urged Titus that just as he had begun, so he should also complete this grace to you. Now this grace he's talking about is the grace of giving it's talking about verse in chapter 8 and 9 is talking about finances so this grace there's grace that abounds for us to give and this verse 7 says now as you excel in everything faith speech knowledge and in all diligence and in your, in your love for us excel also in this grace he's seeing that their faith was excelling and their speech and knowledge He's also encouraging them to excel in their giving. <clears throat> then uh, verse 8, I'm not saying this as a command, rather by means of the diligence of others, I am testing the genuineness of your love. That's just jumped at me. He was testing their love based upon how they're giving. <laughs> John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world... That he gave. Love is connected to giving. I mean, we can give and not be in love, but if we're if we have love, we will give. Hallelujah. That's just like, yeah, well. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich for your sake, he became poor. So that by his poverty you might become rich. You know, Jesus came, not just to save us, yes, praise God for that, for salvation. If that'd be all that there was, that'd be enough to shout and worship about. But he also became poor so we could be rich. Then I want to jump down to verse 12 says, For if the eagerness is there... It is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. So this love he was testing them was in what they had, not in what they don't have. Hallelujah. So God doesn't judge us. If, we, if you don't have it, I mean, so this, you should extend this love to yourself. If you don't have it, don't beat yourself up. Because I can find myself too quick there looking at my own life, you know, at what I don't have, which that's where, yeah, all 
I guess that's where a love of money starts taking root if you start looking at what you, what you don't have. <laughs> so praise God. And our offerings are acceptable because of what we have. Hallelujah. <clears throat> praise God. I think that's all I was going to share on that. So um, I guess I'll actually go to chapter 9. Hang on a little bit. Because this should be a... Verse, chapter 9, verse 7 says, each, pers- each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, out of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. Well, that's how I want to come, is to beforehand to decide of what we're giving. Not, you know, I mean, it's okay if you're on the spot. Sometimes that happens if you're taking up... <laughs> Special offerings, you have to decide on the spot, but usually we should be preparing ahead of time and deciding what we're doing, but praise God. I think we'll receive up the offering. Uh, Curtis, you want to pass the, so we like to get up, or stand up, I should maybe say that a little nicer again, <laughs> but raise our offerings to the Lord. Father, I thank you for this opportunity again to worship you in this way in our tithes and offerings, Father. I want to glorify you and magnify you, Father, that you're promised that if we give, you will give back abundantly, above and beyond what we could ever ask or think, Father. Just pray over this tithe. They would bless it. Thank you, Father, that you open the windows of heaven and you rebuke the devourer for our sakes. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You can be seated. Glory to God. It's good to be here. It's good to worship with you tonight. Isn't the presence of Jesus amazing? Amazing. Well, we're going to go over a couple things before we... we got a special service for you tonight. Uh, I see that it's kind of empty tonight, but it's okay. Uh, they can listen to the recording, but we have some special visitors here. And uh, we're going to have a different kind of service. Is that okay to have a different kind of service? And I think you're going to be very, very blessed by what we have tonight. Amen? You came expecting to receive, right? So I just wanted to go over, um, when you see this book, what's the first thing that should come to your mind? Take it, read, Decree decree it. No excuse, that was what I was looking for. No excuse. Yeah, but Pastor Jay, you know, I just didn't have the time. Well, you know what? You can get your, there's 10 of each back there in the back, and you're going to walk right past it as you leave the premises. So what's the key words again? No excuse, right? You can leave tonight with these in your hand. There's some people making sure they're going to get it and they're not going to forget later. Hallelujah. That's awesome. Daily decrees. There is so many awesome things in here. Daily decrees for family blessing and breakthrough. And daily decrees bringing your day into alignment with God's prophetic destiny. How many know that when you decree things out, you are bringing yourself... Did you just... No, I'm still there. Uh, you're bringing yourself into alignment with God. Amen? So I'll just, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I don't want you to leave satisfied. I want you to leave hungry. See, this is a little bit different uh, when, when it comes to spiritual things. We, we want to, uh, yes, there's a part of being filled, but there's also a part of I want to just give you enough that you go home hungry for more. How many know that if you're hungry, it makes the pastor's job a whole lot easier? So my prayer is that you be hungered and hungered some more and hungered some more, Lee. (laughs) Uh, I'll just read some titles again. Uh, Promote His Goodness, Um, Soft and Gentle Words, Um, you know, even pastor sometimes has some harsh words for some of his family. And uh, so there, right there is a chapter for me, right? Soft and gentle words. Uh, How about um, authority and dominion? Are you having issues with taking your authority or maybe not understanding it fully? 
or taking dominion in your um, in your environment. How many know that you can change your environment? You can change your. Uh, you ever have somebody walk into the uh, into uh, the room and the environment changed? What is that? How about you walk into the room and environments change? I, I, I've been there. I've been on job sites where the environment is not good, right? And, and I had people cussing and swearing in front of me and saying all kinds of four-letter words. And, and, and in a couple minutes, I have, didn't say a word. I didn't correct them. It's not always my job to correct people, right? If the Holy Spirit tells me, I will. But, uh, you know... Uh, uh, but uh, I would have people come to me and say, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't swear. Well, who told them? It wasn't me. Change the environment. That's what's happening. We're changing the environment. That can be you. You can change environment. You can change your office environment. One of the ways to change your office environment is to decree and declare before you get there how your environment's going to be. And then when you show it, you walk in it, right? You say, you know what? This, this office is full of peace. And that's just the end of the story. It will always be full of peace. And I speak peace over this building. I speak peace over my boss. I speak peace over my coworkers. I speak peace, which is much more than just the English word peace. It's, it's the, if you look up peace, shalom, in the Hebrew, you'll get many more meanings and understandings of it. And you speak this and then bring it. And your environment changes. Your environment. The framing goes a little different. You know, you ever have a job where everything just goes wrong? And then you begin to speak to it and say, you know what, you're going to line up with God's destiny. God has blessed me in the city. He's blessed me in the field. He's blessed me wherever I go. So whatever my hands touch is blessed. And that means coordinating these jobs so that they go well. And I can build buildings faster than ever before. Those two-by-fours and the, that plywood just kind of jumps up on the building and nails itself. There's a million-dollar idea, brother. <laughs> Anointed and appointed. Challenging places erased. Mental oppression. Restoration and payback. Mental oppression is bound. So, so many good things in this book. And I, again, what's the key words? When you see this book, what's the key word? No excuse, amen? I know, I should have called Brenda Kuhneman and uh, tell her that I'll be her promoter. You know how, how the boxing matches go and, and you have promoters? I think I could do that, right? In this corner we have... <laughs> The Daily Decree book, oh, glory to God. Well, uh, the other thing that we're going to, uh, I'm going to have tonight is uh, we have a leadership training that, that we have operating, um, and, and part of what it is is it's for people that are uh, want a little more than just showing up every Sunday. Now, some of you are really disciplined people, and you're able to just, you know, um, just get everything done to the T, and you got all your T's crossed and your I's dotted. Well, the rest of us aren't all like that. So in our leadership training, part of the reason we call it LTS, not LDS, just to make sure we're clear here, LTS, Leadership Training School. And what this allows you to do is it, it helps uh, plug you in, and you can, if you're hungry for more, it's available to you, and I want to make sure that everybody understands that. We have another semester beginning in September, and it's, we're going to start on the second week of September, and we're going to go all the way through to the end of the year. I believe it ends in January, is that correct, and, or December? So in December, and then the last, December, or the last semester, or the next semester, is after January the 1st. So I, I'm going to allow Lene. she's been such a help to Kim and I in organizing it and uh, just keeping things running very smoothly for us. And she's been a great asset. We've had, uh, was it 16 students or 18 students? 13. 13. We used to have 16. Is that what it was? Okay, we used to have 16, so we have a little attrition, but that's okay. You know, sometimes... Um, 
things can happen. We understand that life is busy. One thing that this Dale desired with leadership training is to be able to do this in your busy life, right? In your busy life. How many know that Americans are, are, are probably, are, I should say this, uh, are one of the busiest people on the planet, right? And sometimes we don't understand, and we use it as an excuse. Oh, well, we were busy. Oh, well, I'm busy. Oh, this is busy. That's not really a claim to fame. That's actually a lot of times a detriment to what God is trying to uh, get over to you. I'm here as a testimony. Kim and I are here as testimonies. We sowed time and we reaped time. And now we watch other people run around with their heads cut off and we kind of look at them like, well, you know, uh, it's choices, right? And guess what happened to our income while our hours worked went down? Our income went way up. So if God can do it for us, He can do it for you. And then I read on Facebook, sponsored posts, you want to live your dream life? You know, Sign up for my program and I'll show, you, I'll show you how to live your dream life. And I'm like, well, maybe I should write one of them because I'm living my dream life. I mean, who would have th- uh, thunk that you can travel the world, travel the world, preach the gospel, help people, pastor a church, have a family, raise them up in the Lord, have an amazing life, and live your dream life. I'm evidence of His goodness. Now, it's not something I came up with. It's not something I did. It's not something that Jay um, produced or made happen. It's called the blessing of the Lord. And I want you to know that. Well, leadership training uh, is, uh, is some extra things, learning how to fellowship with the Father, become a lifetime learner, and, and also um, you will get some teachings that I may not teach here from the pulpit very often. Right, And so that you will get some of these teachings. And then you have a group of people that there's some accountability. You learn together. There's faith that rises in the group. And we have that happening uh, one Saturday out of a month. So I'm going to turn it over to Lene and allow her to um, talk about uh, what LT- how LTS has changed her life. And I believe she's got a few other people she's going to call on. It's okay, I can yeah. Well, I am also a student of LTS. <laughs> and yes, it has been such a blessing to me and our family of just learning to be disciplined in our fellowship with the Lord. And I... Uh, I think the the thing that I have learned or the thing that has gone the deepest in me so far, I'm still learning, but is that uh, believe we, we know we need to believe the word, but then to act on the word. That is one thing that they really stress in our teachings, our assignments, and to act on the word and then also to speak the word. And that is very, very powerful. And I am learning to do that more and more, and I want, I want to continue growing in that. And I'm just so thankful for the opportunity that we have right here at home in our church that we can actually go to Bible school, that we don't have to go somewhere else like Lee and Joyce did, which that's okay if God calls you to do that. <laughs> but it, we can, it is designed that you can do it in your everyday life with the job that you currently have. And so that is really cool. And I'm not going to lie, it is challenging um, because, I don't know, sometimes it seems if you would just take time away and do it, it would be easier, but then... Yeah, like me, I would never do it. Um, and so I, I like that it is like, like Pastor Jay said, it is 
designed to create a culture uh, in our everyday life to be lifelong learners. So um, I'll go over the curriculum just a little bit to tell you how it looks. We have two classes a month, and those are a highlight very much. Uh, we have had some amazing topics that we have teachers that have come in, and we enjoy when you do it too, Pastor Jay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we have uh, two classes a month the rest of the time we're on our own and uh, then our assignments include the Bible reading daily Bible reading uh, Bible memory daily journaling and then we have assigned books that we read and so like I said, we have 13 full-time students and three part-time students, and I'll explain a little bit how that looks. Um, so full-time student cost is $250, and then there is a first-time, one-time one fee of $75 also. And then our part-time option, the fee is $75, and you can come to all the classes, and you are not obligated to do any of the assignments, but you can do as much or as little as you want, and it just depends on how deep you want to go. So um, you will not receive a workbook when you do the part-time. Um, and then... Uh, one thing that I think is so cool about this curriculum is that a new student can start at the beginning of any semester and it just flows with the rest of the students then. I, I really like that. And so, yeah, 11 of us will be starting our fourth semester and three, no, two, two of them will be starting their third semester. And like Pastor Jay said, our next semester will be starting September 10th. And so it would be awesome if we would have some new students. We, we have a lot of fun. We, we have a wonderful breakfast in our, well, the, the one Saturday, the second Saturday of the month, we have a four-hour class. And we take about 35, I mean, 45 minutes to an hour for breakfast in that time. So, um, I was going to have some people come up and give testimonies, but I don't think I'm doing that this time. Maybe next time. So, if you have any questions, feel free to come talk to me. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Well, thank you, Lene. Well, I guess I don't need this mic, do I? I have double mic'd. Oh, I hit the mute button. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> How many know that Jesus heals the mute? <laughs> Thank you, Lene. I really appreciate uh, that. Lene has been such an amazing help, and, and I'm telling you, if you want to, there's a bond and a closeness that comes with the LTS students. You can't help it. It's, not, it's just something you're knit in your spirit there's a spirit of unity about it you're learning together there's challenges they learn to pray together work through life together and it's been an amazing blessing so um, i believe that this is the way church was designed church was designed to grow people up in their own church and yes i'm uh, there are bible schools i'm not against bible schools um, and that we even have the armada commission if you really uh, want to plug into that that's in Lancaster Pennsylvania and that can be in addition to this and is much more in depth um, 
but a lot of t- but what I guess one of my point is that w- uh, the church was designed to raise up people in the body and give them uh, what what they needed to flourish, right? And if we understand Acts and understand how they did it and the, how the New Testament church was, um, they they had church involved in their everyday life on a consistent, constant basis. There wasn't a differentiation between, oh, and, and, and in America we struggle with this. Well, you know, I have a job. It starts from 7 o'clock and goes to 5. Because of our, we learn to be so punctual, uh, we disconnect from church, right, because it's 7 to 5. And when a lot of times things were incorporated together, that we, they brought Jesus and church life into their everyday life. And, and really, I believe LTS is a, a kind of a, uh, a measure to, to kind of jolt us back to, are we too busy to do this? Have I, am I too consumed? And just like I said earlier, you know, we're a testimony. You begin to sow time, you'll reap time. And, and especially this coming Tuesday night, if, uh, if you're uh, serving here at the church or if you're interested in serving here at the church, we're going to talk about this, and we're going to talk about how you can believe God for your schedule. How many just want to run around with your head cut off, just busy as busy can be for the rest of your life, and slide into the grave and get on to glory, and, I mean, you're just exhausted? Did I describe a life that you want to live? Um, You know, and yet we do this. So why? Why? Well, we just got to make ends meet, right? How many know that we can believe God to have our ends met? And He can supply us abundantly above what I can think because it's according to His riches and glory, not mine. Amen? So I just want us to understand that God, if we use our faith, faith will get us uh, to places that we can't bring ourselves to in the natural. Amen? Well, I'm going to ask this young couple, uh, I'm going to introduce them. We have Bachdan and Sasha. Did I say your name right? And uh, they are from Ismael, Ukraine. And I'm going to, they can come up here and sit here on these chairs. And uh, could I have a chair, please? You can come up here. Nobody wants to give me a chair? I'll get my own chair. <laughs> Thank you. So tonight, I think what I uh, wanted to do is um, I, I just wanted some of you to hear this story. Now I went and forgot my Bible. How many know we need to, pastor needs to take the uh, Bible into the pulpit, amen? So um, what I've been teaching on is Proverbs chapter 3. And uh, so let's open our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. And uh, I believe th- uh, this couple is a living testimony of exactly, uh, for some reason I lost my clip, so sorry about that. We'll have to find it later. I don't know what happened to it. Um, so uh, they're a living testimony of what I've been preaching. And so I wanted to do a little bit more of an interview style. And uh, we're gonna ask, I'm going to ask them some questions. But let's read scripture first. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. And uh, I, uh, I think this is maybe the sixth or seventh um, sermon that I, pr- I preached on this. And I've really been emphasizing one verse uh, for several weeks. I talked on uh, chapter 3, verse 5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And, you know, on a surface level, a lot of times we can sit here and nod to this verse and go, yeah, I'm trusting the Lord, right? How many have nodded to this verse in church, thought it was a great idea? Anybody besides me? You know, yeah, yeah, I trust in the Lord. I I don't think I lean to my own understanding. I would lean on Him, right? I lean on the Lord. And then on Tuesday, the Lord asks us to do something, and we don't want to. So what are we do? Are we trusting the Lord? What are we leaning to? 
We're leaning to our own understanding because a lot of times we need to see the plan step by step in front of us. And see, God, uh, God said it this way. He said, uh, the righteous shall what by faith? The righteous shall what by faith? This is a, a feedback church. Walk? What does it say? You guys need to check your verses. Live. See, you're going to live by faith. See, live is a continual thing. It doesn't say the righteous shall lived by faith. It's a little like faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, not by heard. So you have to exercise faith on a continual basis. You will never get to a place in your life that it's over and done and, you, and, and there is no more. Well, that's a good idea, Lee. Thank you. <laughs> My wife couldn't see me. I'm, I'm, I'm really blessed, honey. So, so uh, uh, the, the righteous shall live by faith. That's a living word. It's a continual word. I, I remember Kim and I believing for a vehicle by faith, and it was the best we knew how. And, and so we, you know, we're believing for a vehicle. And uh, so we're believing for a Tahoe. We're believing for, for a Chevy Tahoe. And we had all these doubters come by and they tell us, well, you know, what if the Lord wants to give you a Ford? And I'm like, well, we're believing for a Chevy. So, so he's not going to give us a Ford. And I'm, we're believing by faith. And, you know, we wobbled and we were just learning, right? And, and we, we believed God and he blessed us and, and we found a Chevy Tahoe for $8,000. And I remember we, I mean, we, we needed a vehicle. Uh, uh, let me just set, set the preface here. We needed a vehicle very badly. We had a Ford uh, Explorer, uh, five-speed, uh, 1993, I want to say. And, um, and one day Kim called me and said, uh, you know, uh, this thing's no longer working. And uh, I think it overheated. And we basically took that vehicle straight to the... Uh, to to the uh, to Reckla Metals and they gave us two hundred dollars for it. So uh, we needed a vehicle. So we're believing to the best of our abilities. Now we don't have a lot of money, right? And and then as we uh, received the vehicle, we purchased the vehicle from a job that we had no idea we were going to get. We received the money, we purchased the vehicle, and after we were done and sitting in our driveway, we go, ah, well, we're glad that's over. We probably don't have to believe God for anything for a bit. I'm here to tell you, eh, that's wrong answer. We live by faith. We will constantly be stretched. We, this, this verse is going to be revealed in our life continually. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You think you trust God. And see, the Holy Spirit will ask you to do things, and it will be revealed if you trust Him. See, just a little bit of what uh, Lene said earlier, LTS helped her uh, uh, act on the Word. See, you only act on what you really believe. I remember get, uh, learning about healing, and I, boy, I'm kind of excited about laying hands on people till God told me to lay hands on people, and then I didn't want to. So did I believe in healing? Uh, not, no, I didn't. I mean, I... Here, I had the understanding, I see it, saw it in Scripture, I wanted to believe, then the Lord said, go lay hands on, on that person and he'll be healed, and I'm like, uh, no, and I fought and cried and argued with God, and finally I'm crying in the truck and I look up and the guy left. So he wasn't there anymore, so I no longer could lay hands on him, so now I cried and repented, and I'm so sorry, Lord, and I'm this blubbery mess, because I wasn't able to do what he asked me to do, and it was revealed what I actually believed. See, our believing gets tested, and, and we can say we believe, and, and, and Christians, Word of Faith people, Pentecostal people, uh, AG people, we can all, we all sit here, yes, we're faith people, and we can holler and scream how, how great faith we have until the Lord asks us to do some things, and then we may not be as strong in faith as we thought we were. So, tonight... Talking to Bogdan and, and Sasha, it just really blessed me about their story. So I'm going to ask them some questions on, on some of their history. We're going to find out their history, and, you, and you're going to find out how we know them. Let me, uh, this thing's not turned on. There we go. So uh, 
Bogdan, we'll start with you. And uh, so let's uh, describe a little bit. Uh, you told me as I was talking to you this this uh, last week uh, that you uh, you were born again, I believe, at age 12, right? So d- let's just talk through that on how that happened and 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 w- w- how did God change your life? Okay. okay. You hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you a lot for your attention, your invite us. And yes, it was in my 12 year age. I was um, like a bad guy and uh, I have a lot of problem with school, with my friend, with my parents. And um, I always try to break rules. I don't know why, but something pushed me to break rules, to make uh, bad deals, and find a problem to my parents, to my circulation, and uh, I feel joy about it. When I when I do when I did some bad thing, I feel joy. And now for me it's a strange, but in that time, it was okay. And mm-hmm. One day, when I changed my school, I mean, I was in elementary school and go to uh, middle, middle school. Yes, my parents decided to attend me to Christian school in Ukraine. It's so strange because in Ukraine it's like maybe one Christian school in city. Uh, but they decided to do it. Maybe it's changed my life. Maybe it's changed my uh, lifestyle. And in the first year of in this school, no something changing in my life. But after a while, after time, um, because we have a Christian lessons, we uh, learn Bible and something like that. Uh, my life start to changing, but so little bit. And I uh, have a friend, my cl- classmate, and he invite me to church to Sunday service church, and I think, okay, it's my friend, and if he want to be in church with me, okay, I will go, I I will do it. And I start and ent- attend church with his parents, because my parents was uh, Orthodox. And so just so everybody knows, so in Ukraine, Greek Orthodox is the church. In fact, the Roman Catholics are the breakaway bad uh, side of, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily like the Roman Catholics because the Greek Orthodox is the church. That's the only right church in the world. Doesn't this sound familiar? Man just doesn't change, does he? Greek Orthodox is the church. Right. So he, his parents were Greek Orthodox. Yes. And my parents don't teach me Bible, don't teach me right rules in, the, in life. And sometimes, b- I think, always a uh, street or school teach me how to, uh, I need to make my life. And um, I started attending church with this man, with this boy and uh, his parents. His parents start teach me Bible. And especially when I was in his, their houses, they have a prayer time before eating, before food and something like um, worship and for me it was so strange but I was in this circulation and this condition and uh, something started to change in my life and one day I remember it was a youth conference in the church and my classmate, my friend again invited me to be with him on this uh, event and I don't know what happened, but when I come to this church, when I come to this room, big room, uh, and fellowship sound so loud, and people make like this, hands up, and I, s- I think, what, what's going on? What they do? Uh, but I don't know. I can't describe it, my feelings bec- before because I don't remember directly, but it's like a hot and cold in the same time in my soul, and something like that, in my si- in, inside me. And um, I also 
make my hands up and um, something happened with me and I say, oh Jesus is if if you if you is if you are if you're if you're if, real if you're real, yes, you're if real. you're real, change my life. I don't know why I say I say this word, but I say it and since this moment my life changed my everything, my schedule, everything, my rules, my understanding of life changed. It was 20 years old. 12 years old, right? 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 years old. So I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. Yes, and teacher in school uh, start to looking for me and my um, my um, my changing. They ask me what happened, what happened with you. Ask my parents because. My parents was so many times in school through my um, breaking rules. Because you were bad. <laughs> yes, I was bad. So now, so now the, the teachers are asking, going, what happened yes, to Bogdan? He's yes, different. Yes, it's not you. It's, uh, it's the other person come to school. Yes, and my parents was so wonder was so uh, surprised about it because they know that I start to attend church, but... For my parents, the um, Pentecostal church is um, it's like a club, interest interest club, something like that. It was since that time. Yes. And my life changed in the Christian event. I received Jesus. I received Holy Spirit. And since this moment, Jesus was me in my heart. Amen. Yes. Amen. That is awesome. Very glad. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus is in a changing business, amen? Yes. And he gets people born again in Ukraine just as well as America. Amen? Yes. Americans aren't special to Jesus. It's worldwide. Jesus loved the world. God gave Jesus to the entire world. Uh, and and so, uh, so now talk a little bit about, okay, let's fast forward. So obviously you meet a beautiful girl, uh, Sasha, and you decide you want to get married, and Sasha was also a believer, correct? She, in in yes. that region or that area, uh, well, or maybe she was from a different church. I don't remember. Did you tell me? Yes. Okay. Um, I share with you this story, um, our love story, <laughs> and if short, we from other district, other area from Ukraine. My wife Alexandra, she from Kiev. It's uh, like a capital of Ukraine. Me from Odessa. It's also a big city, but more closer to Black Sea, more clo closer to Europe. And one day I was on the Bible school, m Bible missionary school on the other city in Ukraine. It was one month school. And my parents decided to make a vacation for rest and something like that and send me about it and I asked my parents okay if you will if you decide it please keep me with you because I also want to rest I want to see the new view and try something new and he said no it's only for us it's like a couple vacation I said oh okay and since three days b three days before after. I'm sorry, my English is not so good. <laughs> and it's getting better, right? Yes. My English is getting better. And she called me, they called me back and say, okay, we will get you with us. And in the same time, my wife's with uh, her mother and her friends, girlfriend, also go to this resort. Uh, yeah, in resort, yeah. a resort in yeah. Carpathian Mountains, uh, on a view like this in Colorado. Yes, and we have a special program. I mean, every day you can change, you can choose your own uh, own idea, own rest in the mountain, on the swimming pool, or um, bicycle and rafting, something like that. And only on last day, we met each other. It was a uh, highest mountain in Ukraine. We tried to hiking. Yes, and so difficult because a lot of rocks, a lot of uh, water, and sometimes people help each other. And I see, oh, this um, 
this girl need my help and I give my hand and say if you need my help you can use it <laughs> and help to hiking on this mountain and after that we start texting message uh, in social media Wow, yeah. God can work through text messages. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> and um, she was a believer in childhood, but after that, s some problem with family, and something happened, and um, she started make your own life without God. And for me, it was trouble because I am Christian, I am believer, and uh, I think if it will be my wife. She need to be Christian. She need to be believer, live with God, with Jesus, and something like that. I start to pray. I start to preach gospel again for my future wife, and uh, we have a meetings on the other city in Ukraine because I live with my parents. She live with her parents, and for more communication, we need to make more meetings, and. My idea was uh, having meetings on the youth conference, youth Christian conference. I uh, invite m my future wife, Alexandra, to this youth conference. She say, okay, I want. And on this youth conference, something happened. Like me, when I was a child, uh, and the same thing in the e youth event, youth conference, Something happened with my wife. She was like a cry and something like that. Feel something, feel God inside. And I think in this moment also changed uh, her life. And now she also believer. We are Christian family together. Amen. And Amen. yes. And, and even uh, Bogdan was even talking to me. He prayed for his parents. He prayed for several years for his parents and his. Uh, parents then received Jesus. Inter we, we were we've been talking about intercessory prayer. Uh, I tell you what, the Ukrainians know how to intercede. I've been over there. I've been, I've witnessed it, and uh, they they know how to pray, and their prayer meetings are full. They understand the power of prayer and understand that it takes prayer to change environments, and it was a blessing for me to see that. Um, so let's let's now go. So now uh, he's married to, to his wife, and um, so um, he doesn't know anything about the Ten Men Project. Um, uh, we did. He just got word uh, through the grapevine that uh, uh, there was these Americans coming to help, and uh, uh, called the Ten Men Project. And they were coming into town, and, and, and now uh, Bogdan has not told me this, but I was told this by some, some, uh, uh, Pastor Vitaly. He's like, when they first heard about it, they were like, oh, are we, we going to have to babysit a bunch of Americans? <laughs> and uh, and to the truth be told, that often happens. Uh, because uh, the Americans got to go get, they want the excitement. They want to see the, you know, they, they want to kind of be there but not be there and kind of help, but help their way, their, do their thing. This is very real. And, and I know that Ukrainians have come to us crying because uh, we make it a priority for our organization that we're there to empower Ukrainian pastors. We're there to do it the Ukrainian way. We're there to help them. We're not trying to go in and do it the American way. We're, we're, we're wanting to help what they're already doing. And by the way, going into a war zone is very different than living life in America. So why do we think we know how to do things, and Americans think they know how to do things, and to go in there and try to do things the American way and plan for two weeks? You can plan all until you're blue in the face, and you can get a phone call in five minutes, and every single plan you just plan changes. So now what do you do? And, and we've got to be led by the Holy Spirit through these things, in even a higher level than a lot of times we allow ourselves to be led here. In, 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 in America, a lot of times we're led by our own understanding of schedules. I'm pausing for effect. Some of us are so scheduled, we don't allow the Holy Spirit to move. Now, you can fall in the other ditch also, and I believe there's some, there is, God can work with schedules. But if our schedule is so packed and so full, we can't allow the Holy Spirit to move, there's something wrong, right? 
and, and going into the war zone, you, you lean on Him. And you say, Lord, He knows what is we can do the next 10 minutes, the next hours, the next days, right? So I, I want to hear from Bogdan, and I want to get this on record, and I want people to hear from church here. Um, so tell us a little bit about just, uh, you know, Tell us a little bit about uh, how the emotions that you felt uh, right before the war. Uh, well, let's go into that. That that would be good. So right be- before the war, so January, February, uh, you you had a job, uh, and you were a driver, a delivery driver, right? So you you delivered some things to different towns. Talk about that just a little bit. Yes, um, in Ukraine we most of schedule like American people. We have a lot of free time. We have a job time, free time, and ministry time, a lot of prayers. And live in Ukraine, like so slow, not fast. You understand that now you work, after that you have a rest, have a prayer time, have a meetings with friends, and something like that. But um, for us, uh, I, I, yes, I, I work like a driver. Uh, I deliver it foods and grocery on the local stores. Uh, and also if something call me and order my car, my, um, uh, me like driver, I receive this call and uh, people pay me money for my uh, delivering. Yes. And we hear about war. We, our government tried to make like, no, war is not come to Ukraine. You need to be, you need to work, you need to continue your life. You need to make your plans. No war in Ukraine, don't careful about it. But a lot of people, a, to, a lot of news say war, wo- war, war will come to Ukraine. Russia prepare, because we see a lot of video how Russia prepare on the border their equipment, military t- equipment, a lot of soldiers, thousands and thousands. And we ask about, like, uh, government, wow, what they do? Our border, a lot of, full of Russian soldiers. War is, not, wa- war is not coming in Ukraine? No. And people don't believe because it's uh, like a now 20, 22 and you can imagine that war start in America, in other countries. No, we can't imagine. It it most most people can't comprehend if Canada would invade or yes. Mexico would invade. We can't comprehend it. Your yes, neighborhood come to your country yeah. and try to do something with weapon. And we don't believe in that. We try to make our lives, try to work, to grow up our children, make our churches, preach the gospel, and live like in the last year, I mean, no something special. Only which we do, it's a pray about wisdom of God, about protection, about peace, and something like that. And one day, uh, it was 5 or 4.30 o'clock on the morning. All of people sleep in Ukraine at this time, and something strange sound come to Ukraine, I mean Russian rockets come to Kyiv, to Odessa, and our people, especially in Pastor Vitaly Church, we have a lot of friends, call to us and say, rockets come to Odessa. We move to Ismail immediately, and I say, wow, I don't believe in that. And we uh, try to find it in the internet, news and yes broken news we woke up with broken news about war in ukraine i remember that day um i seen it on the news um and um soon after i had been praying about bringing pastor dale uh which you have not met uh, but pastor dale is our director for the 10 men project and he's actually in, in, a, in a city in, in uh, Ukraine currently. And um, Pastor Dale and I were on the phone because we were actually talking about bringing him out here and minister in several places, several evenings in a week. And we began to pray. Uh, so this was after the war started. 
And, and I asked him, I said, are you going to come here? I think you're going to go to the Ukraine. And immediately he was like, yes. It was like uh, God was you know, speaking to him. But sometimes it's just like it's gnawing in your spirit and you're not sure what it is till somebody says it, right? So on that phone call with Pastor Dale is when the 10 Men Project was born. And uh, that's when we decided we're going to send 10 men and we're going to send $100,000, was at the time and still is one of the most efficient ways to get things there. The quickest and the fastest is to take cash in. And it's also the most money efficient. And here's why, because uh, the banks will give you 29.5 grivna per dollar. Grivna is the Ukrainian money. But you can, if you ta- have cash, $100 bills, you can go down uh, to the local money exchange and you get 35.5 grivna. So you got about a 15% difference. If you send a wire, you immediately lose 15%. And so that is part of the reason we take cash in because we wanted to be able to empower pastors immediately on the spot. So uh, this was born and we begin to plan in the beginning of March uh, to send 10 men in. Now, uh, Odessa was kind of on shaky ground right at the beginning. Uh, A lot of people thought that it was going to be actually a peaceful, uh, this is a testimony from me because I heard the prayers, I heard the people praying, but the city of Odessa is run by a lot of mafia, and they were Russian mafia. And so when the war started, Pastor Vitaly and his church, they began to pray that, uh, that it would not be taken over by Russians. And, and um, uh, okay, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. The um, Lord just reminded me of some things. So he was praying that they wouldn't uh, uh, be taken over by Russians, and, uh, but they were friendly. Odessa was friendly to the Russians. And in the first stages of the war, there ended up being a storm on the Black Sea for, for numerous days. Do you remember that? And it kept the Russians from landing their ships on the beach. And by the time the storm was over, something had happened between the mafia and the Russians that uh, they no longer were, were on the same team. And so by the time the, the storm was over, they, uh, they quickly uh, placed uh, mines all up and down the beach. You can't go on the beach this summer uh, in Odessa because uh, I, I said, well, I asked the translator, Sergey, when I was there, I said, ah, I said, you know, how do you know that it's mine? He's like, I'm not going to find out. So the beach is mine, you don't go on the beach, and it's to protect from soldiers landing. And uh, I believe it was directly from uh, Pastor Vitaly's church praying, believing God that it would not be invaded, and that the storm happened and delayed that landing, delayed it to the point that now they're not on the same side. So uh, uh, what what the Lord just reminded me, let's talk a little bit about, there's still a lot of people in America that do not believe that that there's Russians in Ukraine. Uh, they don't believe, they believe that it's all propaganda and that there's no Russians, no Russians have invaded and Ukraine is actually blowing up their own buildings uh, to give get sympathy from the world. Let's talk about that a little bit. Okay, I try to describe the situation uh, and also which I can notice in this um, before I talk about situation in Ukraine. Every day, Ukrainian churches have prayer ministry. Yes. Every day. Every day. Every night time, our churches in Ukraine pray one hour. Yes. Every church. And I was a part of some of those. Pr- when I was there, I would go over from the apartment. I would go over to Pastor Vitaly's bunker, and we would be in the bunker, and I would join them in their one hour of prayer. It starts at 9 p.m. every single night, rain or shine, whether we're there or not. Uh, Pastor Vitaly was even on the Zoom call, and we went to Zaporozhye, one of the cities uh, up uh, north and to the east, and, on the, and we didn't make it back in time. And he, would be on, he was on his phone, and he, he was that dedicated. He does not miss a prayer meeting. I don't care where he's at, what he's doing. If he's got cell service, he's on that prayer call. There's, I actually found out afterwards that there's a thousand people that join on this Zoom call, up to a thousand people. I I'm not sure if every night there's a thousand people, but they've had as many as a thousand people on that Zoom call praying for one hour for the, for the country of Ukraine. 
Yes, I know it's uh, like online and offline yes. prayings. I mean, ministry in church, we build our schedule and we keep in our minds that at the same time every day, we have one hour, need to go to church and pray with church about peace and stop war in Ukraine. And um, first day when war start, about three or five days, we still don't believe. Because you don't believe it's even really real yet. Yes. The first couple. Of yes, days. yes. Our people and our, you know, because we live in Ismail, it's so near to Europe, yeah. and it's like a more safety place than Kiev, than Odessa, than. Uh, Ismail is about 20 miles from Romania border. Yes, and also Kharkiv, so near to Russia, and we don't believe in that. Uh, People who surround us say, no, it's fake, it's a fake news, don't believe in that. But a lot of news, a lot of video try to come to our channel, our um, Telegram um, chats uh, and something like that. And Instagram also full of video, how rockets uh, explode the buildings, how people die. Especially uh, broke news about Bucha and Irpin, yes. Kiev region. Buka, yeah, this yeah. Uh, is a younger cities built in Ukraine, so beautiful, a lot of trees, a lot of rivers, and so beautiful. And people uh, try to live there because Kiev so full. Yeah. So um, Kiev is a very big city. Yes, a yes. very big city, maybe like Denver. Yeah. I don't know. And Similar. so yeah. and so crowded by people, by car, and in something. In fact, it's bigger than Denver because I think Kiev had over three million people, right? Um, and the whole state of Colorado is four and a half million, something like that? Yes, a lot of people. And people decide to live near to Kiev because it's um, more natural, more uh, useful for your health, and something like that. Buy flats or houses on this region. And to Russia, try to make a circle around Kiev. Th they have a plan to take Kiev yes. by three days. Yes, in three days. It's a Putin plans take Kiev by three days. And now it's six months. Yeah. They well, still try. And this is things that I have uh, learned as going over there. Uh, they were expecting uh, the Ukrainians to just kind of lay down and let them just take over. Now you gotta remember, you got communist mindsets happening. Uh, Putin wants to bring uh, Russia back to the glory days of the USSR. And that's his desire, that's what he wants to do. So Ukraine used to be one of the states of the USSR. And so they, their, their uh, um, intel was telling them that if they invade, that the Ukrainians will just lay down and, and say, oh, yeah, and, and it'll be a peaceful takeover. And what's evidenced by that is the first soldiers that came across, they didn't even want really want to fight. They, they just were like, um, you know, and Ukrainian farmers were, uh, it became kind of a, a funny thing because a tractor ended up pulling the tank that ran out of fuel, and it became a nationwide thing because uh, the Ukrainian farmer was, was uh, doing a good job of resisting Russia. And, and the Russians weren't expe really expecting to fight. And then when, when obviously they got pressed into it as Ukraine resisted, because, and this is what I want to make sure that people understand, Ukraine does not want to be communist. They don't want to be communist. They had years and years of communism. They do not want to go back to communism. They have no desire to, and I believe as, as a, a God-given right to all people, all people have the right to defend themselves, right? And so they do not want to be communist, uh, communist so they pushed back you know, on the invasion that they thought was going to be peaceful. And as they came in, it, it then wasn't peaceful, and they began to lose a lot of troops, a lot of tanks, and then the Russian war machine began to operate. And the Russians do not understand and do not believe in sanctity of life. See, if 10 Russians can't make it, they did this. If you go back and study the Battle of Stalingrad in World War II, uh, it, it will it, just study. This is for you to go back and research and study it. But in Stalingrad, they, they fought 
they, they, they didn't care about how many guns they had. They didn't care how many tanks they had. They didn't care any of that. All they cared about was, is there more people willing to cross the river and fight? And so Russia operates on the premise of, we will just send more soldiers. And as long as Putin has more soldiers to come across, he, 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 he doesn't care about bullets, doesn't care about ammunition, he doesn't care about losing tanks, he just sends more soldiers. And, and why, why is that a big deal? Because they don't understand the, the, that life is important. They actually now call the front the meat grinder. The Russians do. And it's about entering the meat grinder. Why do they call it the meat grinder? Because so many people are losing their lives, Ukrainian and Russian. Uh, they estimate that there's about 100 uh, Ukrainians losing their life and, and up to 300 Russians. Nobody knows for sure because uh, this is something that both sides don't want to talk about. The Ukrainians don't want to talk about Government doesn't want to say how many they're losing because they don't want people to lose morale. And the Russians for sure aren't going to say how many they're losing because they want to appear like they're winning, right? And, and so they call it the meat grinder uh, right now on the Luhansk and uh, Donetsk front. Um, so, um, so that was the beginning of the resistance. And then Ukraine soldiers begin to resist. Kiev was not taken. And they actually pushed... Uh, the Russian occupation back from Kiev, and that's when the eyes were open to what Russia is actually doing. And uh, I'm talking to you now as a pastor and as a protector of my family and my church. And uh, again, God has given us the right of self-defense, of defending ourselves. You can read about how those things, uh, you can read your Bible and understand that. Um, but when they went, uh, what was the town, Buka, is that how you said it? Bucha, Bucha, the, t the town of Bucha especially, uh, they rounded up the men, took them into the basements uh, of the houses, and they had one bullet hole in the back of their heads. They were defenseless, had no, had no weapons, and this is what happens to defenseless people, right? This is why I believe that our Second Amendment is so important in this country, so that this cannot happen to us. And we've even had discussions already, if Ukrainians would be armed like Americans, Russia would never have invaded. Because not only would you fight the army, you would fight house to house, right? And as every man uh, uh, having a wife and a child, you want to protect them. It's part of the reason you're here. So that, that's a little synopsis of the, of the war. We can ask them some more questions. We're at 8.15, so I want to I get into a little bit on... Um, how then what happened okay so the war is happening it is real right uh, it, there is an invasion there are Russian troops on Ukrainian soil they are there they are bombing uh, buildings they are bombing innocent people right and uh, there's a, Mariupol was reduced to rubble and they, they're trying to do that to several more cities oh we got the batteries that died We'll give it a one second. Thanks for your patience. Uh, what's that again? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll ask you another question. We want to shift a little bit to um, uh, when you heard about 10 men leaning to your own understanding, right? And because I, the reason I ask him to share is because it's, there's a miracle that happened. It's a miracle that they're here. So um, you're now living in Ismael. The war's real. And you hear about the ten men uh, that there's this these people coming from America, and so just give a little bit of thoughts on 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 that and and what some people had mentioned to you today. Okay, um, and the way I, I recognized and understand that war is real before what Russian do in Bucha and Irpin. It's like desert. It's like ruins. And people, a lot of people die in this area, and we really 
feels is sick, feels is uh, fair, and we understand that, wow, the war is real. My wife says that it's not a war. I mean, if some country have a reason, I mean, uh, take a buildings or take a people, this war not have a reasons. And Russian soldiers who come to Ukraine, they not kill people, I mean, because it's like a protection each other. They have a, like, a, I don't know, like evil inside and they kill children. They have what inside? Mm. Like evil spirit. Evil spirit. Evil, evil, evil spirit. spirit, yes. I yeah. mean, it's I not I have noticed that you, uh, you've said it and some other people have said it that a lot of the Russian soldiers now that are coming across, they're, zomb they're like zombies. And what you mean by that is they have no heart. They have no heart. They kill anybody in sight. Now, the first soldiers weren't that way. Be and I, and I, uh, that goes back to, I believe, Putin thought that he would just take over the country and there'd be no resistance. So he was just, they actually thought they were just, uh, they did kind of didn't even know where they were. Uh, a lot of those first soldiers, when the farmers confronted them north of Kiev, uh, they were like, oh, well, we're just out on a, on a, on a military exercise because that's what it was called. It wasn't called a war. Still is not called a war. It's called a military exercise. Now, the better soldiers are coming, more trained soldiers, and a lot of Ukrainians say they have no heart. They have no, they don't know between uh, good and evil. And we got to understand the communist lifestyle has stripped God out of their country for 80 plus years. So if there is no God, then you can kill as you will. It does not matter. There is no, uh, there's no, uh, now this doesn't make them unsavable, Right, we still want them to receive Jesus, but they are—they have no heart. They kill with no heart, uh, and th that was the story of, in, in Bucha, where they're just lining men up and, and killing them. Yes, and I mean they uh, kill people not with a gun, like men, people like uh, soldiers. They kill all of our uh, people. I mean women, yes, children, yes. without reason. They also try to. Repeat, repeat, yes. Um, women's repeat women's. Rape. Rape. rape women. Yes, it's a. I don't know this word, that, but it's translation. Rape women. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I talk. I have personally talked to pastors that sat there crying, because they took women through Russian checkpoints. Okay, they witnessed it. The Russians are in Ukraine. And the reason I'm emphasizing this, I just read a thread on Facebook today, and they're like, nah, yeah, they're still, there's no Russians there. We're just blowing up bio labs, and, and we're still down that train. And there is Russians in Ukraine. I, I spoke to the pastors. They're crying because as they get to a Russian checkpoint, they stop them, they bribe them with a $50 bill, and they allow everybody to go except the prettiest girl on the van, and they keep her. Because it's happening on a daily basis. And yet we have Americans that watch YouTube and uh, think that some YouTube star knows what it is and he's not even there, right? And the people, again, on the Facebook thread, none of them went to Ukraine. None of them were there. None of them know. They just have, they believe things. And, and, and you know, deception and th this deception in, in, in the American church, why does it matter it for me as a pastor? Because when I go and, and, and I talk about giving and helping the church in Ukraine, there's some people that refuse to give because they say, oh, there's corruption in Ukraine. So I, my pat answer anymore is, uh, uh, did you pay your taxes? How many paid their taxes April 15th? And if you didn't April 15th, you're going to October 15th, right? Right? Is there corruption in our government? Did you just support our government? And it's something to think about because there's a lot of innocent people dying on a daily basis in, in Ukraine. So uh, now let's, let's get back to, you hear about the 10 men project. Yes, and um, we recognized about war really ha happened in Ukraine and a lot of volunteers and people, brothers, brothers and sisters from uh, worldwide church come to Ukraine to try to help 
to get our refugees uh, leave Ukraine. A lot of European people um, make this help for us. And especially in the first three months, we have a, like a new service, new ministry. We have a buses. We rented a buses or if church have buses. A lot of church do the same thing. They fool people, fool refugees, and go to Europe, go to Europe. A lot of Ukrainian refugees now in Europe and the worldwide countries in America and Canada, and like, m like we also here. And uh, I hear about uh, some Americans' brothers need to come in several days, maybe two or three days, and they will come to Ukraine and for some reason, I mean, helping and provide service, help with refugees and something like that. And um, because Pastor Vitali was so busy in this time, uh, his church can get, receive two brothers from 10 men project. But he decided to uh, others, brothers on this project, give for our church in Ismail, especially Pastor Jan Church, and young pastor, and uh, he ran church three years ago in my city. We really mm, so close friends, and sh he said me, maybe you will interpret or translate these people for my church and our ministry in Ismail and our site. I say, no, Pastor Jan, we friend to each other, but it's so hard, so difficult for me because my English so poor, my English not so well uh, for this so I, kind I of ministry. So I stop you right there. What, what are we doing? What, what, what's happening in Bogdan's life? His English isn't good. He can't do this. The pastor comes and asks him to do something, but he can't. What's Bogdan doing? No, he's not yet. He's going to, but he hasn't yet. What's he doing? Leaning to his own understanding. This is why I have him up here, because he would not be sitting here in America looking at you if he would have stayed leaning to his own understanding. See, leaning to our own understanding will keep us captive and will not allow God to continue to work in a powerful way in our lives. One of the first nights this week that we, uh, we had him up at our house, I gave him the Church of the Word cup, and on the bottom it says, Expect Miracles. The reason we need to expect miracles when we step out in faith, when we step out in faith and do these things. So as he's going to continue uh, to talk and explain about how, uh, first of all, he, t he told Pastor Jan, no, 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 he can't. He can't. His English isn't good enough. He's shy. And, and, and he doesn't really want to step out. He feels inferior, you know, and he, he just doesn't feel like he's the guy. Yes, for me it was a so difficult challenge to translate, to interpret English speakers, people, brothers. And I say for my pastor, for Jan, my friend, I'm so sorry, but no. <laughs> it's so, so hard. We need to find other people, other guy or brothers or sister and he said okay we will pray we will find and this this um, I mean uh, asking will in my mind three days two days and it's like uh, making some Something some was stirring in, in my in my sight in my spirit I feel maybe I need maybe no I'm and something strange i feel i something strange uh, strange i feel inside and i try to like make no it's so difficult and uh, no my way uh, i shy my english is uh, every day i say it for me this word this every is day. going over in your head you're, yes you're yes not good enough i have a fighting in my mind yes with my thinking yep. And I try, no, 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 no. And one day, Brother Jan come again and say, they will tomorrow morning, we so need your help, maybe a little bit. And my father hears this, uh, Jan ask, 
you are asking and say, yes, you need to be here, you need to try, you need to, like, uh, it's experience, you need to uh, make this. And so I say, yes, really? And in this evening, I decide, okay, I will do it. I will interpret it, I will try, maybe I can. Yes. Amen. And so uh, I actually, so we come in um, across the ferry, we get to Ismiel, and, and we stay in Pastor Jan's church in the, ba- in the basement. And there was uh, eight of us men, eight of the ten, two stayed in Romania to transport food down. So there was eight of us in the basement. And then I left, uh, Anthony and I got up really early in the morning and left with one of the brothers and went on to Odessa. So I never met Bogdan. So there was still six. Scott's not here tonight, but Scott was one of them, and David Lamaster was another one. And they stayed there, and for that week, they went out and preached the gospel to villages. And, 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 and I know that some of the men were uh, maybe somewhat uh, disappointed on we didn't feel like we did enough. And, and th- that's very easy to do, uh, feel that way when you get into uh, a country um, and, and, you know, with the American way is to go in and get as much done and be as efficient as possible, right? We've all been taught that from little on up. So we go in and it's like, oh, well, we're just going to these villages, you know, and preaching the gospel, you know. No bombs hit these villages. And uh, that's true, but they also uh, were, the, the villages are still affected by the war. Uh, Bogdan lost his job as soon as the war started. The villages are still affected because they already were poor before the war. They lose any uh, connection or, or uh, jobs, and now they're, they're running out of everything, right? And so these people were so blessed to receive the food and, and, and the, the bags of, of food that you guys did and, and the groceries, which was made possible because of the cash we brought in to the city. We were able to give to Pastor Jan, and Pastor Jan would just go out and purchase things, and we brought things from at, uh, from Romania, and we were transporting it down to the ferry and getting it across the ferry and to Ismail so they could be handed out. And so uh, those six men uh, had Bogdan to, to translate for him, and not only was it, you know, we're looking at, well, did we help or did we do enough for the people in the villages? But that relationship is then what sta- uh, started it so that uh, they stayed in contact, David especially, David Lamaster, stayed in contact with Bogdan afterwards. And when this house became available up here in Eckert, um, there was, uh, and we're going to wrap it up because it's 8.30, but uh, there was a house that was, there was an Afghanistan family was going to uh, move into, and then it, for some reason it never happened. So David began to check in and see if he could get Bogdan and his wife to come and and Bogdan's just shared with me, uh, you know, uh, of course he wants to uh, leave and he wants safety for, for his family. He doesn't want to sleep and uh, be afraid of bombs exploding. How, how many know that all of us, or I'm sure every one of us would pick that, right? And so uh, David arranged some things and uh, purchased tickets for him uh, to bring him over. And they're living in Eckert right now. And we didn't even know each other till three days ago we met. Uh, you met uh, Anthony on the streets of Odessa just a couple weeks ago because you've seen 10 men, right, on his T-shirt. And so Bogdan went over and said hi to him. And uh, so here we are uh, in America because he uh, stepped out in faith, began to translate, even though his English wasn't very good, didn't think his English was. But you got to understand when they don't speak your language and you don't speak their language, I don't care if it's broken English, you're happy. <laughs> Right. And and so he stepped out. That relationship was built. God could have never done what he did for them if he if he would have said, nope, I'm not stepping out of the box. And that happened to Kim and I in in March. We stepped out. We uh, I was asked to to head up the 10 men project in the middle of purchasing a business and pastoring a church. Uh, I didn't think that was very possible myself, you know. And here we are, and everything's flourishing, everything's going uh, well, and uh, I'm so uh, excited with what God is going to do in this city. And uh, just building a relationship with Bogdan and Sasha here the last couple days has been so wonderful because I see 
uh, uh, Bogdan has been a, a, a believer since he was 12, and Pastor Vitali and Pastor Jan trained him well. He served in the church. They both have served in the church, and they're still very, very young, but they have some understandings that, quite frankly, some of us Americans still don't have, right? You can learn from them. I can learn from them and, and how they have operated and done some things. And I'm just so happy that the two of you are here, and I'm blessed. I, I just count it. It's an honor for me to get to know you better and and uh, I know we haven't heard your wife speak very much. She, by the way, she understands English quite well, and enough even to correct her husband on occasion. <laughs> I thought it was so cute the other night. Uh, he said an uh, uh, incorrect word, and, and she she knew the word. And so I think it's so awesome what God's doing, and uh, I believe that He's brought you to America for a, a, a mission, and and because. Uh, I was just thanking the Lord today. Uh, now, you know, if I get on a Zoom call with uh, any Ukrainians or Russians, I have a translator. And I don't know if that means anything to you, but it sure meant a lot to me that that I got somebody that can translate all the conversations. I just gotta, I just gotta give them a phone call. So, um, anyway, I think I think maybe uh, Max is about uh, at the end of his limit without his mother. So. Uh, we're just so thankful that you're here. We want to bless you as a church, and uh, we welcome you. We want to help you in many ways. And Kim and I have already uh, been helping them, and, and there's more things to do. They're willing to work. They're willing to do what it takes. Um, by the way, ladies, just a, a shameless plug, Sasha is a nail tech, and she's going to be getting her license here in a little bit. And... Uh, and so please, uh, she does a great job. I've seen her Instagram photos, does an amazing job. So if you need your nails done, you want them fancy, uh, she is going to be the one, right? Go to her, give her all the business you can, tell your friends. I mean, if she has a line out the door, I don't think she cares right now. She wants to help, wants to work, wants to help provide. They're not here to mooch off of people. They're here believing God and, try and making their life a better life. And, and because they're at a better place. And I've seen thankfulness pour out of them of what God has done. The impossible. A year ago, they never thought it would even be possible to go to America. And here they are as refugees um, getting their, um, uh, the correct paperwork done. It's not all finished yet, but they're working on it so that they be can become American citizens. And they want to benefit society. And I believe that America can use uh, Ukrainians preaching the gospel because we can learn how, the, how they go out and their outreach and what they do. So thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. Thank you a lot for your church, for your ministry, especially uh, 10 months in so important ministry to Ukraine. If somebody think 10 men... Mm, it's so important for Ukraine. A lot of brothers for this project come, preach the gospel, help, help grocery, and now Ukraine is so open to receive Jesus. Yes. It's people really afraid. People have a fear, and they find a peace. They find try to keep something, and Jesus is one hope who can help Ukrainian people, and especially it's last my word and uh, we are christian we operate uh, or i mean we believe in bible and i need to say something from bible okay yes go ahead when we was in ukraine only one thing give for us peace uh, and we pray and we read the bible and it's a uh, josiah at old testament joshua or Jos uh, Isaiah. 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 I'm sorry. Isaiah chapter 43 and first three words. If you can read it for your church, sure. because yes, it's give for us peace. Of which verse? First, and to I love you. One to four. One to four to I love you. Okay. 
But now God's message, the God who made you in the first place, Jacob, the one who got you started, Israel, don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name. You're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am God, your personal God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I paid a huge price for you, all of Egypt, with rich Cush and Seba thrown in. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back. Trade the creation just for you. So don't be afraid. This place in Bible give for us so many pieces because a lot of afraid, a lot of fear. Every day you think about Russian soldiers can come to your city, to your home, to your family, and it's so strange. It's making you cry, afraid. You you can do anything. You can protect your city, can protect your church, your family, and only one hope which Ukraine people have it's a God. And so important tenement project because people find God, find a hope, peace, and I think I sure that only in Jesus' hand we can find this peace. Amen. Well, thank you so much, so much for for opening up your hearts to us when we got there. Now we can return the favor and, and return it to you. And I'm so glad that, that you open up yourself to step out and try something what you weren't comfortable in. Um, can we hear your wife say one sentence? It's beautiful. We'll, we'll, we'll give her the mic. Just, just say, hi, how are you? So shy. It, it's on. Just go, hi, my name is... <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, I want to say thank you and your project because it's so important important for Ukraine and um, uh, uh, when you make your work uh, Ukraine is leap thank you I am glad to know you both of you yeah we so appreciate church, your church, your help for us, especially David, the Master family, your family, and others who help for us. So thank you about it, and now, thank you, Jesus, we in peace, we in safety, and we still pray for our families, for our churches in Ukraine, and as can we can help, we will help for Ukraine, and also uh, we'll uh, Suggest, suggest, suggest. Yeah. Uh, ten man's project. Ah, you'll put a you. You will help us. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Promote I mean. Promote ten yes. man project. Thank I you. Mean. Thank you. Thank you for. Well, me. I tell you what. I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask them to come down here, and we're just gonna lay hands on them, and we're gonna bless them as a church. I believe God has raised them up for a time for this time, and Bogdan has already told me how he's not going to waste his time in America uh, because he wants to help more Ukrainians. And so church, you can come up here um, and let's surround them and tell them we're for them and uh, we want we want to see the mighty name of Jesus lifted up uh, in this time because I believe, and I, I shared this with Bogdan earlier uh, tonight, is I believe that the devil always oversteps his bounds and what's going to happen is not only is there going to be revival in Ukraine, he spoke about how many people are so open to the gospel, but it's going to spread right over into Russia. Mm-hmm. I've seen this in a vision when I was praying in Pastor Dally's bunker and it's going to spread over into Russia and Russia will be brought to the gospel like they have never experienced in their life. And, and any type of anti-God spirit that is alive in Russia and Ukraine is going to come down and will no longer operate in Jesus' name. And I believe that these countries are going to be brought to another level of the gospel being ministered. And, they're gonna, and those people from Ukraine and Russia are going to minister to people all over the world. 
because the world needs them. The world needs Ukrainians preaching the gospel like never before. Amen? Father, we thank you so much for this precious couple. And Father, that the anointing and the calling that you have on their life. And Father, we just give you the glory, we give you the honor for bringing them to us. And Father, show us uh, and lead us and guide us every step of the way on what they can uh, do here in the future and what your will is and how you want it laid out. Father, your word says that, your, uh, that, that you make the path straight. And Father, we thank you for that. And, and as Bogdan and Sasha are incorporated into the American uh, uh, culture, that Father, that, that it can be done rapidly. It can also be done uh, that they, they, they have friends here, they have family here, because we love Jesus. And that's what makes us friends, and that's what makes us family. And we just uh, uh, lift them up, that you surround them with your peace that passes all understanding as they pray and intercede for the rest of their family, for other people in Ukraine, and, and especially for the, for the, uh, um, for the uh, government of Ukraine and also for the governments and, and also Russia itself, that this war will stop in Jesus' name. And it is not allowed to proceed in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, welcome to America. Welcome to America. Well, I believe that was our dismissal prayer, too. So uh, um, thank you for sharing tonight. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, whatever we can do as a church, we want to help. And uh, I know that you have groceries. I know that uh, there's things that you have, but there's also some things that you don't have. And uh, we're going we're gonna to help surround you. And uh, I just, I think it's awesome. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's awesome that we're in a position that we can help. So thank you, thank you. Well, Tuesday night we have uh, service. And again, it's on... on uh, how to uh, how to uh, serve? <laughs> kind of <laughs> blank there. Uh, I, hopefully, I remember by Tuesday night what exactly <laughs> what it is. So, how to serve Tuesday night? And I, I'm learning from the Ukrainians on how to serve because let me tell you, they get it. They get it. They have an understanding of service that's just off the charts. And Pastor Vitaly has done a wonderful job uh, training everybody. He's done an amazing job, and I count it a pleasure to be called his friend. Once you pray together, believe together, and you're in a bunker together, it makes you friends because you want the right people in the bunker. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, thanks for coming out tonight. And um, I'm thankful to introduce Bogdan and Sasha. So.